Are there messages in our Christmas hymns that will teach us more about the true meaning of Christmas? That's what we'll talk about today. Sing praises to the Lord, who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds among his people. Psalm 9, 11. Today we're going to talk about hymns, and particularly Christmas hymns, and what kind of messages we can learn about Christmas from these hymns. And we're going to do so with the book, Come, Let Us Adore Him, Stories Behind the Most Cherished Christmas Hymns by Robert J. Morgan. I read a podcast about one of his other books, The Red Sea Rules, previously, and I did enjoy this book. So I'm looking forward to seeing what this book talks about now. He talks about a number of hymns, and we won't be able to go through all of them, but I thought we'd hit a couple of them so we know what they meant. He says that because this is such a great time for singing, enjoying music, how Christmas hymns are sung openly compared to other religious music that a lot of times people won't sing in public. He even said, sadly, that when people in North Korea, Christians, try to sing hymns to God, they do so with their mouths moving and no voice coming out so they don't get captured by the North Korean government. He says there was a quote from Ruth Bell Graham, we should sing when we feel like it, for it is a shame to miss such an opportunity. We should sing when we don't feel like it, for it's dangerous to remain in such a condition. And he thinks Christmas time even more so. Even more times we should sing and let those hymns go to God. He says that the reason he wrote the book is many of the stories themselves have been lost to history. And so he wants to bring them back. And when you look at Robert's biography, he has written a lot of pieces, a lot of books, done a lot of videos, and he has a podcast. Oh man, I just can't handle another podcast, but now I'm going to have to listen to it because I like his book so much. He goes through many carols, some of which I haven't heard before, like We Sing Emmanuel, Thy Praise, or he mentions While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks. Now, this one I have heard of. And some of my favorites, we'll talk about a few of them. Joy to the World, 1719. I love that. Isaac Watts was the person who wrote this song. He said that at the time, most churches sang from Psalms of David. And the church, especially the church in Scotland, worked very hard to translate these songs and poems into singing. But Isaac was from Southampton. He didn't like the quality of the singing. And he felt it was very limited to only sing the Psalms. So you know what? He invented hymns, I mean, non-psalm hymns. He still used some of the psalms and some of the ideas in psalms as part of the basis of the ideas, but instead he took the psalms, viewed them from the perspective of Jesus, and then put them into singing. So they were a different take on the psalms of David. He wanted to know, quote, I have rather expressed myself as I may suppose David would have done if he had lived in the days of Christianity. And by this means, perhaps, I have hit upon the true intent of the Spirit of God in those verses farther and clearer than David himself could ever discover. Meaning, you know, David wrote them before the time of Christ, but this is what it would be like if David had written them at the time of Christ. So that's a pretty big undertaking. He wrote Joy to the World based on Psalm 98. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. And I love that hymn. It's one of my favorites. I even liked it when I wasn't a Christian. It just is that joy of Christ, that spirit of the moment. And so when you have this joy expressed in this song, you just got to love it. Hark, the Herald Angel Sings, about that in Charlie Brown Christmas, was written in 1739 by Charles Wesley. And he started writing hymns as soon as he became a convert to Christianity, he wanted to take basically doctrine, beauty, all these things and put them into songs. So he said that he often stopped at the the side of roads asking people for pen and ink so that he could start writing some of these hymns down. He wrote 6,000 hymns in his life and he didn't like people changing them at all. In one hymn he wrote, I beg leave to mention a thought that has long been upon my mind and which I should go long ago have inserted them into public paper had I not been unwilling to stir up a nest of hornets 
And he even wrote about how much he disliked people changing his words. Hark the herald angel sings, glory to the king of kings, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinner reconciled. Joyful all you nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. Universal nature say, Christ the Lord is born today. And he said that the word, the vault of heaven, was the old English term, welkin, which was a term that was used in the first verse of it, hark how the welkin rang. But eventually we changed it into something that we would understand better. And George Whitefield was his friend and published his collections of hymns in 1753. Love, hark the herald angels sing. Again, another one of those songs that brings out that triumph of Christmas. Handel's Messiah was written, of course, by George Friedrich Handel, despite the fact that he was a lawyer by profession. But the organ and violin and other instruments of music is what Handel really loved the most. And so one day, he was accompanying his father to court, the court of Duke Johann Alda, and George wandered into the chapel and found the organ and started playing it. And the Duke exclaimed, who is this remarkable child? So another one of those musical prodigies. And as Handel got over, his music kind of lost the luster that it used to have. People started no longer showing up to his concerts. And Friedrich the Great said, Handel's days are over. His inspiration is exhausted. Yet one morning, Handel received, he said, a letter from Charles Jenin. And there was word for word of the biblical text of Christ. And from the words of Isaiah 40, which inspired Handel, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. And Handel shut the doors and started composing music. In 23 days, it took him to write Handel's Messiah, which obviously is Handel's greatest piece of work. It's what everyone knows really of him. He said, quote, whether I was in body or out of body when I wrote it, I know not. Flow moment where you don't even know if you're there anymore. And then he played it. In London on the 23rd of March, 1743, leading with his harpsichord. And King George II, who was there, was surprised, leaping to his feet at the Hallelujah choruses. And it became his most famous piece. O Come All Ye Faithful was from John Francis Wade. And he was in England. He was Roman Catholic in Lancashire. I can't ever say those shires correctly. And persecution of Catholics started coming up during his time. So he went from France to Portugal to flee this persecution. He was a refugee, and so money was hard to come by. And they say in those days, printing music was very hard. It was copied by hand. So Wade started teaching music and started copying music. And he was so good at it, he became quite known for it. And in 1743, at the age of 32, he created a Latin Christmas carol, Adeste Fidelis, O Come, All Ye Faithful. Also, such a beautiful hymn. And so some people at that time thought it was so beautiful that he discovered some hymn that was from ancient times and wrote it and did the copywriting for it. But they really think now Wade wrote it by himself, composed the lyrics because this was all original manuscript in his hands. It has his signature on it, too. And he died at the age of 75 in 1786, and people honored him for his beautiful manuscript. And it's so stunning to hear those words at the beginning, quote, ye faithful approach ye, didn't catch on, not for years and years. Perhaps it was because it was in Latin, he said. And one day, an Anglican minister, Frederick Oakley, who preached in London, found the transcripts, ye faithful approach ye. And later, when he converted to Catholicism, perhaps his Latin improved, and suddenly he came up with simpler terms. He rewrote it and came up with, O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Boy, I love that hymn. And again, it's one of the classic hymns of Christmas time. But it wasn't until years after John Wade passed away his hymn finally saw the sun and started being sung by other people. Silent Night, another favorite, was written by Salzburg's Father Joseph Moore. And he prepared it for a midnight service. I mean, isn't that perfect, singing Silent Night at a midnight service? But his organ at his church broke. 
And so he knew that the music for the night was wrecked because there was going to be no organ music. But the book said, quote, Father Joseph was about to learn that our problems are God's opportunities and that the Lord causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him. So then Father Joseph started to write a new song that could be used without the organ. And he wrote, Silent Night, Holy Night, All is Calm, All is Bright. He took the text he wrote to his organist, Franz Gruber, and explained to him the situation. They sung that song on December 24th, 1818, and accompanied it with a guitar. The organ repairer came, saved the Christmas special, but then, then the hymn started spreading around Austria. And it would be sung by people like the Von Trapp children who were represented in The Sound of Music. They sang Silent Night, and it came to the intention of all the people around them, the king and the queen, and they gave a royal performance. Eventually, it was used by Americans and German-speaking congregations, and then became, in its English form, a Sunday school song in 1863. And if it hadn't been, he said, for that broken organ, there wouldn't have been the song Silent Night. One of my favorite renditions of it comes from Amy Grant. I just love hearing her voice sing that song. But in general, it's just so beautiful. When I was not a Christian and I was in eighth grade, my music teacher was looking for someone to play the guitar and play Silent Night on the guitar, saying it was part of history. Well, I loved history. I wasn't a Christian. But I'm willing to give everything a shot. And so I told her she would teach me how to play it on the guitar. I would do so. And so she did instruct me. Even though I couldn't read musical notes, she taught me until I had it memorized and I played it. Now that I understand how terrible my music skills are, I bet you it didn't have the beat it was supposed to have. But opportunity is for those people who volunteer. And so I got to play Silent Night on the guitar for my eighth grade Christmas festival. The first Noel is just a beautiful song, but nobody knows who wrote it. It appeared in a book published by David Gilbert in 1823, Some Ancient Christmas Carols. And it had a lot of traditional music in it. And this particular hymn was in the book. It's another one of those carols that touches the heart and is sweet and gives you memory of Christmas. O Holy Night was written by a French wine merchant called Placide Chapeau in 1847. And he was a mayor of a town in the south of France. And I guess we don't know a lot about him. He said that we know more about the man who composed the music for it, Adolphe Charles Adam, who was the son of a concert pianist. And Adam's was probably around music his whole life and trained. He wrote his first opera at the age of 20 and a couple more operas towards the end of his life. But John Dwight, the son of Yale's president, Timothy Dwight, discovered the French carol, Christian Midnight, and translated it into an English hymn, O Holy Night. After graduating from Harvard and Cambridge, my goodness, John Dwight, was ordained as a minister of the Unitarian Church in Northampton. He didn't have a good experience uh, being a pastor, moved to a commune called Brook Farm. John was hired by the director of Brook Farm School and began writing music. And then Robert Morgan said that it's really interesting how a wine merchant and a very liberal commune-dwelling clergyman would give us one of the world's holiest hymns about the birth of Jesus. It came upon a midnight clear. It was written by Edmund Hamilton Sears, who authored two Christmas carols. He was born in Massachusetts in 1819 and went to Harvard Divinity School. He wrote Calm on the Listening Ear, which was a carol based on the angels in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Then 15 years later, he wrote It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. There's no mention of Jesus in the song because Sears also was a Unitarian, and it focused more about peace on earth. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel was written as a series of Latin hymns that was sung on Christmas Vespers, which is from September 17th through the 23rd of Christmas. And then each of these hymns had O in it. So, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. 
It was published in 1851 by John Mason Neal, who put together all the pieces of it and came up with the first draft. He was born in London in 1818, and he was the son of an Anglican churchman. He attended Cambridge University and became a prize-winning poet. So he was an Anglican minister who had Catholic leanings. Then he served as a director of a home for old men. (laughs) That's kind of a funny name, which was a good job for him because he had such compassion. But the book says, as a high church traditionalist, Neil disliked the hymns of Isaac Watts and wanted to return back to the dignity of Christian history. Isn't it interesting how history just builds on itself? Is Isaac Watts gets sick of all the Psalms of David, so he writes new hymns, and then Neil gets sick of Isaac Watts and wants to go back. He started writing hymns and translating ancient Greek and Latin hymns into English. And he says that today we find Neil and Watts together in the same hymnals. He says, quote, we owe a debt of gratitude to John Mason Neal every time we sing one of his Christmas carols. Good King Wences, good Christian men rejoice. All glory, laud, and honor, and O come, O come, Emmanuel. And Neil started putting together these hymns from Greek and Latin. So when he put together his hymnal for English churches, he would translate songs that had more dignity. In 1862, we got Angels We Have Heard on High. It was part of a French carol that was from the 1700s and then published in English in 1862. But the older version had the title, Hearken All, What Holy Singing. (laughs) This was interesting because, again, I'm kind of a history nut. But What Child Is This came about in 1865. And it's so, it is sad, but it's also the melody of Green Sleeves. Now, when I was in that same eighth grade music, we had to sing Green Sleeves. And then it struck me, why is this the same melody as a hymn? And that's when I really figured out some of the hymns were made into common melodies, and vice versa, the common melodies were made into hymns. But the song Lady Greensleeve was supposed to be composed, was supposedly composed by Henry VIII for Anne Boleyn. And we don't know for sure, but we know that Queen Elizabeth danced to the tune, and Shakespeare referred to it in The Merry Wives of Windsor. So it did come around from that particular time. But the words were taken from a poem by William Chatterton Dix, born in Bristol, England in 1835. And he wrote this prose to be a Christmas carol and put it to the tunes of Greensleeve. And probably now is more sung as a Christmas carol than what we remember of Henry VIII's ballad to Anne Boleyn. I wonder what Henry VIII would have thought of that. O little town of Bethlehem brings him that image from Micah 5-2, prophesizing that Bethlehem was going to be the place of the birth of our Savior. It's such a little place, it was given to the last child of Jacob, but being the smallest is what God loves the best. And so this hymn came about from Philip Brooks, who was from Boston, and he was a tall guy from Puritan backgrounds, and he became an Episcopalian minister. Robert J. Morgan says, quote, his sermons were topical rather than expositional and he was criticized for thinness of doctrine. And so when he was at Philadelphia's Holy Trinity Church, he went on a pilgrimage in 1865 to Jerusalem, which he traveled to by horseback. I don't think he saw any horses when I was in Israel, and attended Christmas Eve services in Bethlehem. And he was so moved by it. Quote, he said, I remember standing in the old church in Bethlehem, close to the spot where Jesus was born, when the whole church was ringing hour after hour with splendid hymns of praise to God. It seemed that if I could hear voices I knew well telling each other of the wonderful night of the Savior's birth. He then was getting ready three years later for the Christmas season, and he wanted to write a Christmas hymn for children. So he wrote, a little hymn with five stanzas, and gave it to his organist. So his organist struggled with the music. He said that he woke up with music in his soul and jotted down the melody. And the next day, the Sunday school children sang, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Brooks was happy with the tune, and he named it after his organist, Louis Redner. 
changing it to St. Louis, spelled like the city St. Louis, so that he wouldn't be embarrassed that this was named for him. And one of my favorites is Go Tell It on the Mountain. That this song was written during the time of slavery was a spiritual from the slaves, and they would sing it while working on the plantation. In 1907, the Jubilee Singers of Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, took the song of the plantation to other people. And it was one of the very last spirituals, it says, to be found and was a unique Christmas carol. John Wesley Work Jr. was born in Nashville in 1871, and he grew up singing in his dad's choir. When he went to Fisk University, he joined the music program and got a master's degree and was hired as a professor of Latin and Greek. But he still loved music and preservation of the spirituals. And while many of the spirituals were published, Go Tell It on the Mountain was still unknown. And so when those Jubilee singers came about and then singing this song, John wrote two new stanzas for it, and it became his custom before sunrise on Christmas morning to take his students caroling and sing Go Tell It on the Mountain. It was published in 1909. And John Work had been called the first Black collector of African-American folk songs. Isn't that great? So he took that music and let the world know what a beautiful song it is. So my challenge to you is think about the Christmas hymns you like to sing. And maybe give it a moment to look up some of the history and figure out what some of these songs are about. The stories aren't so straightforward and sometimes they're not very well known. But sometimes understanding the roots of a hymn will help you understand the meaning of it even more. All right, everyone, thanks so much. Merry Christmas. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. And remember, our step towards the new year with the birth of our Savior fresh in our mind starts with small steps. Small steps.